love apples. Hi, you guys. I'm Tracy Lund with the Divide County Library. And we are so excited to partner with the State Library for Summer Reading Kickoff. Like I said, my name's Tracy, but you, you can call me Johnny Appleseed. I'm going to take you on a little adventure today while I'm curled up here with my fire. What's that? My hat? Well, as legends say, I wore a tin pot or a tin hat and a double as a pan for me to cook in. Pretty inventive for me. I mean, if you ask me. Let's get started. I'm going to read to you today, Johnny Appleseed, a tall tale retold and illustrated by Stephen Kellogg. It's a tall tale because no one truly knows my real story. But this one, it's good version by my favorite author. John Chapman, who later became known as Johnny Appleseed, was born on September 26, 1774, when the apples on the trees surrounded his home in Leominster, Massachusetts, were as red as the autumn leaves. Johnny's first years were hard. His father left the family to fight in the Revolutionary War, and his mother and his baby brother both died before his second birthday. By the time Johnny turned six, his father had remarried and settled in Long Meadow, Massachusetts. With a decade, their little house was overflowing with 10 more children. Nearby was an apple orchard. Like most early American families, the Chapmans picked their apples in the fall, stored them in the cellar for winter eating, and used them to make sauces, ciders, vinegar, and apple butter. John loved to watch the spring blossoms slowly turn into the glowing fruit of autumn. Watching the apples grow inspired in John a love of all of nature. He often escaped his boisterous household to the tranquil woods. The animals sensed his gentleness and trusted him. As soon as John was old enough to leave home, he set out to explore the vast wilderness to the west. When he reached the Allegheny Mountains, he cleared a pot of land and planted a small orchard with the pouch of an apple seed he had carried with him. John walked hundreds of miles through the Pennsylvania forest, living like the Indians he befriended on the trail. As he traveled, he cleared the land for many more orchards. He was sure the pioneer families would be arriving before long and he looked forward to supplying them with apple trees. When a storm struck, he found shelter in a hollow log or a bill to lean to. On clear nights, he stretched out under the stars. Over the next few years, John continued to visit and care for his new orchards. The winter slowed him down, but he survived happily on a diet of butternuts. One spring, he met a band of men who boasted that they could lick their weight in wildcats. They were amazed to hear that John couldn't hurt an animal and had no use for a gun. They challenged John to compete at wrestling, the favorite frontier sport. He suggested a more practical contest, a tree chopping match. The woodsmen eagerly agreed. so quickly cleared, he thanked the exhausted woodsmen for their help and began planting. During the next few years, John continued to move westward. Whenever he ran out of apple seeds, he hiked to the cedar presses to replenish his supply. Before long, John's plantings were spread across the state of Ohio. Meanwhile, pioneer families were arriving in search of home sites and farmlands. John had located his orchards on the routes he thought they'd be traveling, as he had hoped the settlers were eager to buy his young trees. John went out of his way to lend a helping hand to his new neighbors. Often he would give his trees away. People affectionately called him Johnny Appleseed, 
and he began using that name. He particularly enjoyed entertaining children with tales of the wilderness adventures and stories from the Bible. In 1812, the British incited the Indians to join them in another war against the Americans. The settlers feared that Ohio would be invaded from Lake Erie. It grieved Johnny that his friends were fighting each other. But when he saw the smoke of burning cabins, he ran through the night shouting a warning at every door. After the war, people urged Johnny to build a house and settle down. He replied that he lived like the king in his wilderness home, and he returned to the forest he loved. During his long absence, folks enjoyed sharing their recollections of Johnny. They retold his stories, and sometimes they even exaggerated them a bit. Some recalled Johnny sleeping in a treetop hammock and chatting with the birds. Others remembered that a rattlesnake had attacked his foot. Fortunately, Johnny's feet were as tough as elephant's hide, so the fangs didn't penetrate. It was said that Johnny had once tended a wounded wolf and kept him for a pet. An old hunter swore he saw Johnny frolicking with a bear family. The storytellers outdid each other with their tall tales about his feats of survival in the untamed wilderness. So many cool stories. As the years passed, Ohio became too crowded for Johnny. He moved to the wilds of Indiana, where he continued to clear land for his orchards. When the settlers began arriving, Johnny recognized some of his, the children who had listened to his stories. Now they had children of their own. It made Johnny's old heart glad when they welcomed him as a beloved friend and asked to hear his tales again. When Johnny passed 70, it became difficult for him to keep up with his work. Then, in March of 1845, while trudging through the snowstorm near Fort Wayne, Indiana, he became ill for the first time in his life. Johnny asked for set shelter in the settler's cabin, and a few days later, he died there. Curiously, Johnny's stories continue to move westward without him. Folks maintain that they'd seen him in Illinois or that he greeted them in Missouri, Arkansas, or even Texas. Others were certain that he'd planted trees on the slopes of the Rocky Mountains or in California's distant valleys. Even today, people still claim they've seen Johnny Appleseed. The end. What did you guys think of that one? I really, really love that book. Now, I don't know about you, but I would hate for this fire to go to waste. Do you guys like to do anything special around campfires? Me too. Roast marshmallows. Mm -mm -mm. But you know what's my favorite? S'mores! Oh my gosh, I just love s'mores. The chocolate and the ooey gooey marshmallow. Now, do you like it burnt? Don't like it burnt. You like to get it nice and brown and oh, I know. Let's make some s'mores. S'mores! Oh wait, you probably don't have a fire like me. Hmm. I have an idea. Follow me. I have a little trick up my sleeve. I'm going to take you to my back cave. Or just to my back room. Here's what you need for a good microwave s'more. Two graham crackers. Some yummy, yummy chocolate. Now, I'm just going to do one marshmallow. But you, you can get crazy. And you could do like or get really crazy and do like three. Oh my gosh, it would be Marshmallow Tropolis. It would be so yummy. Oh, that sounds good. I'm popping it in for about 10 to 15 seconds. Don't want to get too crazy because I don't want the chocolate to get too melty. But now, look. Oh, 
I could just right now. But I'll put on. See, look at that. Oh, hold, please. Hmm. Now. I know that's not an apple, but that's pretty good if you ask me. I hope you guys really enjoyed my story, and thanks for hanging out with me today. Watch everybody else. Adios.